Day. Welcome to the Church at the Beaches online service. I hope that everything is going well in your life. Um, if not, well, I'd love to pray for you. And uh, my contact information will be available at the end of the service on the screen. But right now, we're finishing up on the road. And it's our four-week journey, our four-session journey, on how to be involved at the Church at the Beach. Uh, who we are, what we believe, uh, we've gone through those type things, and now we're just going to finish up with making sure that everybody knows that we are to serve God by serving people. So I hope you enjoy, and I'll see you on the back end of the service. Well, God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. The gospel prospers during the good times and the bad. Oftentimes more during the bad times. Fair enough. That's when we come around and realize we can't fix all this mess on our own. And we're going to have to rely on God to do it. 
in his great providential and sometimes miraculous ways. You know, we're going to talk a little bit today about choice and trying to finish up this week because, Lord willing, next week we'll start in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to go expositionally all the way through the book of Mark together. And I'm telling you, we will make sure every Sunday stands on its own as a sermon, so invite everyone that you can invite. But those of us that are here at the beginning all the way through, man, we are going to go on this journey through the gospel, gospel of Mark, and God's going to bless it. He is going to just, man, these people are down there on the beach, and they are in my word, and they're studying it, and they're breaking it down. I have to tell you, I like preaching this way as opposed to how I have been for the past three months. For the past three months, I've been preaching topically. Pastor, I guess because we think we know so much, hopefully it's Holy Spirit-led, we, uh, we choose topics that we're going to preach about. But see, sometimes when you preach on topics, people think, oh, well, he, he picked that out because I said this or I did that. Or sometimes people think, well, I don't really agree with his topic or this or that. Guess what? When you just preach through books of the Bible, we're just preaching what it says, brother and sister. If you don't like it, tough luck, I reckon, you know? You can take that up with God if you want to. And so I really look forward to it. Uh, to my previous pastor, we spent two years and eight months going through the book of Luke. And so uh, there's, it's probably about a year. But today we're finishing up on the road. And this is the third Sunday we've been on the road, and the people, you are at an advantage if you're already here, because this is the, the, what we're going to really urge people to go through when they come, and the Holy Spirit leads them to come be a part of what we're doing at the Church at the Beach. We're going to urge them to go and get on the road with us. And so it's going to be three or four hour-long meetings where, where we, we, we say, okay, well, this is the way our church is set up. This is what we believe in as a church. These are the things that are important to us, and these are the ways that we're going to make that happen because we fully believe God's hand is in it. Yeah. And so we're going to urge people to get on the road. But we're going to wrap this up today, and I'm looking forward to it. But the first thing that I want to mention as far as the sermon goes is this. Oh, man. On the road of life, we have to deal with sin. Here this preacher is talking about sin again. But hang with me because I think that it's going to be okay and I think you'll survive it. You know, sin makes life more difficult. You know, oftentimes people think that preachers are talking about sin to beat you over the head. Absolutely not. What I'm telling you is if we will live our lives in a way that is just focused on God and by His ways, your life will be better and easier. So it's not so much like, oh, I've got to miss out on doing this from now on. No, it's more like I get to live with the assurance and the comfort that my life is pleasing to God and he is going to bless what he has said he would bless, Amen. which is righteous and holy living. So your sin, my sin, it makes our life more difficult. Sin brings mountains to climb and valleys to sink into. That's no fun. I'm not talking about challenges at work to take off a little more than you, you know, a little bigger bite than you should because you want your company to grow or something like that. I'm talking about unnecessary mountains and valleys because of sin. And then I want to tell you that if you'll choose God's ways, you can totally avoid self-created mountains and valleys. Life will still be tough. But it doesn't have to be you looking in the mirror and saying, what have I done to myself? Because I simply would not just live the way God has told me to live. We're going to look at Adam and Eve first. If you would, open your Bible or turn them on. We'll have it up on the screen for you if you don't have a copy of Scripture. But Genesis chapter 2. Now, I'm not going to take anything out of context, but, but we're going to read verses 8 and 9 and then skip down to verse 17 because... Those middle verses just give some descriptions of some rivers and stuff, and we've got a lot to talk about. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 and verse 9, and then we'll go down to 17. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, 
Some lady, I don't know if she comes first, second, I can't remember who it is, has a charm of the tree of life on a necklace. I love that. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So in Genesis chapter 1, God creates everything, but then right away in Genesis chapter 2, he's created this tree of life. And here, let's look, and let's go to the last chapter. So we were right at the beginning. Now let's turn to the last chapter of Scripture, what God has given us to know him and his ways by. Revelation chapter 22, five verses, one through five. And this is John, and he has, he has been given these visions, even though it was only one revelation, okay, He's been given these visions, and this vision is of the eternal heaven, not heaven right now, not where, not where your, your soul would be if you die today. I'm talking about this eternal place where God, the creator of the universe, is the sufficiency for all beings forever and ever. It gives some descriptions later on, but we just can't even picture it in our minds. So let's, let's just stick with these five verses. And he showed me a pure river. This is John writing of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, and each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were, were for the healing of the nations. That word healing right there is what we use for therapeutic, if we talk about therapeutic type services and procedures. It's therapeutic from this tree of life. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. I cannot wait. I don't know about you. But here we have from the beginning of the Bible and the end of the Bible, we have God purposely talking about the tree of life. And folks, I have to tell you, you have a choice. You have a choice in how you live. For a long time, people have maybe not wanted to come to church because they felt like they were going to be beaten over the head with all of this concerning the tree of life of good and evil, or the tree of knowledge. It is a necessary point of the gospel, and we're going to preach it every Sunday. But folks, if we want people to want a piece of Jesus, then we're going to have to start telling them that he originally designed us to be right there in the tree of life, and good Lord, we're going to one day be right there at the tree of life where he is going to sustain us all, and we're going to have no needs, no tears, no worries, and it's going to be better than anything we could ever imagine. We have forgotten to tell people how great being a child of God really is. Amen. It's not about a list of do's or don'ts. And so here's your choice as a human. You can live dependently on God for the tree of life, or you may live independently of God for the tree of knowledge. But you can't live both. And for me, I'm choosing to live dependently on God for the tree of life. Now, once we have God in our life, we've established the fact that Scripture teaches us we're supposed to be working out our salvation, but also we're supposed to be working for his kingdom. Now, Brother Barry and Sister Debbie are going to sing a little song. I would have my, my wife sing it. Calvert City, First Baptist Church in Kentucky. It was her first, she sang a duet with her older brother. I think her, I think her older brother was part of it. But I was going to have her sing it, but she said that she was in the nursery and that was just too important to come and, and sing in front of everybody. But some of you grew up, Ronnie knows that that's a joke and so does Gannon, my boy and my great friend. But folks, I, I want to, and you're fine, you can, you can start on the keys just a little. I want you to think about the words to the song. And I want you to think about the fact that we've told children this over and over and over again, but then somehow we have become adults and we think for some reason we should have arrived, but we didn't. And so we should have arrived as Christians by the time we're an adult. We didn't arrive 
by the time we're an adult. So now we really can't, can't do anything because we're not worthy. So let this children's song sing it, sink in. telling you is he's still working on you too and just because you're not some completed product doesn't mean you shouldn't be working for the kingdom of God but are you a leader you know when I was a kid this really good basketball player named Charles Barkley was really famous and I love Charles Barkley he says some of the best stuff he's always putting his foot in his mouth because he's always telling the truth and you know how people don't like that and uh and so he said something this week. I can't bring it up off the top of my head. I can't remember what it was, but it was really funny. But when I was a kid, Charles Barkley said this. He said, I'm not a role model. Because sometimes he'd get in trouble during the games, you know, and all this. And, you know, Chuck, I hate to tell you, brother, but you are a role model. You are a leader, whether you want to admit it or not. But now here's... Charles Barkley, this wealthy guy that's really, really famous. But here's what I have to tell you. You're a leader too, and so am I. Because you know what leadership is? Influence. And no matter where you are in life, you have influence over people. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily their boss. But we influence others. Now, you might say, well, Jay, you have a lot of influence. Potentially, possibly, I do. Maybe Barry, you know, choosing, selecting songs has a lot of influence. Folks, I, I don't think so. I think that we all are leaders and we better own it if we're going to expand the kingdom of God with what he has revealed for us to do. You influence others. You influence others by if you wake up on Sunday and go to church or not. You influence others by when someone says something is going wrong in their life and you say, let's pray about it real quick instead of, I'll pray about it tonight. You influence others when they see you doing something kind for a neighbor that doesn't deserve your kindness. We lead people. And some people will say that good leadership is being nice. Good leadership is making things comfortable. No, what good leadership is, is putting the people you're influencing or leading in situations where they can be successful. That's what good leadership is. It's not the fact that even though we are friends, that Brother John and I are old buddies that hang out all the time. It's the fact that doggone it, if he needs it for the kingdom, then it's my job to make sure that we provide it for the kingdom. If he needs something new, doggone it, then we've got to do what we've got to do to provide it for the kingdom so that his ministry can be successful and his ministry can be successful and his ministry can be successful and the Lord's church will be exactly what it's supposed to be because I guarantee you nobody can be as successful as Jesus. Leadership is influence and we are all leaders. God never uses the perfect people anyway. Moses was a murderer, couldn't talk right. King David, an adulterer, best king, Jesus, was going to come from the lineage of King David. No one had a heart for the Lord like King David. He was sinful. You are too. But God used them and God can use you. So what holds us back? What holds us back? Myself included. Here are some things, listening to people preach, studying, thinking through it on my, my own. Here are some things that hold us back from serving and getting to work for the kingdom. Insecurity. I don't know if I'm good enough. Fear. 
Tell you what, if you're fearing serving God, I must ask you, do you trust God or yourself more? Because your fear is something you're fearing. But if God has led you to do something, then doggone it, that means he's going to see you through what he's leading you to do. And I promise you, he is bigger than your fears. Inadequacy. No, no, no. God is going to prepare you if he is leading you to do something. He will make sure you're not inadequate in order to get the work done. And reluctance. Tell you what, with God on your side, you can and will be successful. But there are two things that Satan does and uses to keep you from being successful and getting to work for the kingdom. And these aren't as cool to talk about. But Satan is going to use your possessions and your problems to keep you from serving God the way that you should. You know, I've got a golf cart at home. It's old, but it runs. When I remember to put water in the batteries, it runs. But you know what? I've learned a lesson from that golf cart, and I like it. Get to the beach and back, blah, blah, blah. The more stuff you have, the more problems you have that take up your time that you could, could be going and telling somebody about Jesus with. And that's just an old golf cart, okay? But your possessions will keep you from serving God if you're not careful. And then your problems. But folks, we all got problems. And our problems should lead us to God, not away from God. But Satan will try to twist that to where our possessions and problems keep us from where we should be. I'd like you to know that your qualities are going to bring more success than your abilities. Your qualities, your character, your integrity are going to bring you more success for working God's kingdom than your ability. Overall, people prefer passion over polish. Because if you're sincere and authentic and genuine, they'll look over some of your flaws of if you don't say a word right. They'll look over sometimes if you're a minute or two late. But you can be as polished as a bright, shiny pair of saddle Oxfords on a baby boy at Easter. And folks, people aren't going to forgive your care if you're not genuine and you don't have integrity. So what are we going to do as a church? What are we going to stand on? Who are we going to be? Well, first thing I want to tell you, I want you to turn Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Turn there with me. This is a good, a good little verse for us to, to know. It was kind of written about me, even though it was written 2,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago. So here's the deal. Peter and John, they have, so the, the church has just been instituted. The Holy Spirit fell on the apostles and on the people around. I mean, the church is there. Peter and John, jail, no jail, it doesn't matter. They're telling people about Jesus. They've been going up to the temple. They see a man that has been lame his whole life, and he is healed, and he's jumping up. He's bouncing around, and all the religious elite, they know Oh, now we've got a problem. We killed Jesus, and these guys are up here preaching not only that we killed Jesus, but Jesus was so powerful and strong being the Son of God that he was resurrected after we killed him. And now these bold guys are here, and doggone it, they were just a bunch of fishermen from up there in Galilee, and doggone it, now they've healed this guy who we cannot deny that he has been healed. Everybody sees it. And so the religious elite... Luke, writing in the book of Acts, verse thir chapter 4, verse 13. I love this. I hope it'll hit you like it does me. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, the they, the pronoun, are the religious elites. They saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled. Uneducated and untrained if you do a word search, it's going to take you back to the same root word as ordinary. Okay? Now, here's cool, the cool thing, though. If you, if you take the word ordinary and study it a little more, then you get to the word idiot. <laughs> now, when the religious elite saw the boldness in Peter 
boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were idiots, they marveled. We had some people in from Benton, a town I grew up in in Kentucky, and they were nice, and they wanted to get a picture and everything. And I know why. They're going to put it up on Facebook and Instagram. They were going to put something until I preached on it. Can you believe this idiot's now preaching at a church on the beach? <laughs> the, uh, I'll probably be blocked from being able to see it. I'm not on Facebook anyhow, but anyway. So it's about me to this point, but guess what? This next part's about me too, and I hope it's about you too. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. Folks, whatever it is that's holding you back, spending time with Jesus will change you. But it'll make you somebody that nobody thought you could be. It'll make you somebody for the better. Because your character will develop. Your calling, whatever he's created you to do in life, will develop. So we're going to love God. We're going to love people. Mark chapter 10, we are going to serve others. And, and, and as a friend tells me, we're not going to serve others by going and saying, hey, I'm going to do this for you. We're going to go serve others by saying, what can we do to help you and how do you want us to do it? Helping someone the way you want to help them is just satisfying your own lust to feel good about yourself. We're going to pursue excellence. Do things well. We have updates all around this facility that need to be made. Lord willing, we're going to make them. The last room in the, down this west hallway is being turned into a chapel. It'll seat at most 80 to 85 people. Small weddings, small funeral with cremation. Maybe some of our ministries can meet in there. Prayer time. You have a beach wedding of a friend and it rains out. Call us up. We want people on this property using the chapel for their small wedding that was going to be on the beach, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Some electronics already in there. It's already starting to take shape. But anytime after May, just give us another month to finish that up. I've already mentioned other things that need to be freshened up, overhauled, and done here. But we're going to pursue excellence. We're going to know the greatness. People are going to know the greatness of our God because we are going to do things well. In Mark chapter 7, that's what they said about Jesus. People were amazed because he does all things well. And then we're going to choose joy. We're going to rejoice. Luke chapter 10. Rejoice. Always rejoice. And that has to do with attitude. Choosing joy. My mother-in-law is this great lady. The, uh, she's outstanding in a lot of areas. But in my wife's bedroom, when we were growing up, there was this poster. What will make you happy in life? That's a paraphrase. Number one of ten, your happiness in life is only 10% what happens to you. Your happiness in life is 90% how you react to what happens to you. I remember being 16 years old and seeing that for the first time and saying, that makes sense. Life's going to deal you a bad hand. Satan's going to get in there and get to work. You're going to create some of your own mountains and valleys because of your sin, even if you try, are trying not to. But ladies and gentlemen, it's only 10% how it hits you. Your joy is 90% on how you react, your attitude. Well, I've got another song. If you guys would get ready for that. But as we get close to this song, it's uh, based on 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 12. You know, our life must be 100% committed to the Lord. And by that, I mean putting your faith in Jesus. I mean getting freedom from whatever's holding you back in life, all the junk, getting freedom from that. But you don't get freedom by sitting around and talking about it to somebody for hours and hours and hours at $185 an hour. 
You get freedom from all of the junk that's happened to you in your your life by trusting Jesus and getting on the road serving him. And all of a sudden, when you see his glory and his greatness, and you're working for that, all of the things that have been bogging you down and holding you down in life somehow will become strangely dim. I can't explain it, but that's how God works. But before we sing the song, I got a quote from you for you from John Shedd. And the quote's this. A ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. Folks, you're safe in here. We have a security team. We're blessed enough to live in the United States of America. You're safe right here, right now. Fair enough? But God did not create you to be safe in here. He created you and built you and has used your passions and your experiences and your pains to mold you into the person that is going to go out there, much like a ship would go out into troubled waters and be battered and beat around through the storms and through all kinds, occasionally even run aground and then repaired. That's how you're created, not to be a ship in harbor. You're created to be a person serving God out there not just in here. If you would sing a song. Commit your life to Christ, to serving Him, to following Him, working for Him. And that day is going to come when you either die and meet Him face to face, or He returns and we meet Him face to face. And I promise you, it is going to be the most unreal, awesome moment you could ever experience. Hey, so again, thanks for joining us for our online service here at the Church at the Beach. If you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ... I would like to tell you that while it might seem simple, it's actually a life-changing decision to follow Jesus. You know, Jesus said in Mark in chapter 1 that we're to repent and believe. So I challenge you, if you have never professed that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is your Savior, then turn to God with all your ways. Believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin to be forgiven. And I promise you, Jesus will save you. And you'll have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and you'll live a life better than you could have ever imagined. Not because you're going to have more stuff and not because maybe life will be easier, but because you're going to be right with God, the creator of the universe. So we finished on the road over the last three online services. You have an idea of what's going on at our church, how we do things, and the direction we're going. Hope to see you soon in one of our in-person services, either at 8.30 or 10 a.m., But either way, feel free to reach out to me. My phone number and email address are at the bottom of the screen. I would love to hear from you over whatever is on your heart. God bless you, and we want you to know that God loves you, and we do too. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious.